you'll have to excuse the fire going on. We're in the middle of doing a VFX pass. So as we go through here, the crew, as well as having the seating area, they've got their own little recreation room. So we get the design brief from John Crew and his yeah. team, and that you know gives us our basic spec of what we need to hit. Chris likes to keep it as you know open as possible in terms of influences for art, so we can just be free basically. So that's why it was tricky for us to embed these entrances as caves nicely on the terrain. Before we start with anything, with the lighting, we always to figure out what is the part that we need to focus on most. So the idea behind the caves was to create a, a more eerie mood. So by doing this, I designed a bunch of drone sounds and then a bunch of like one shots and things like that. And they trigger randomly throughout the caves. Because we cover so many different things, it's very important that we kind of share knowledge and that sort of thing. With 68 rooms, a massive footprint, and apparently a cargo bay big enough to carry a ballista, the 890 Jump is one of the most hotly anticipated ships in recent memory. Now, while it's currently continuing its journey through the ship pipeline, we thought we'd ask Pete if he wouldn't give us a, a Royale Tour Part 2 of its less flashy, but nevertheless important lower decks. Let's take a look. We're working on the 890. We're holding regular reviews at the moment to try and catch out all the last little things and close this ship out and get it ready for you guys. So I'll give you a little update of some of the stuff that we've been working on lately. So here we have the cargo room situated at the back in the lower decks. Quite a bit of space for the cargo and I'll just clear that out of the way. So got the little windows there, see it going down. Big open space, we've got the components in here, so at the back we've got the jump drive. And then over at this end we've housed all the other main components down here. Got the engine rooms, twin engines either side. Quickly go up these stairs. I'm going to quickly just go through the rest of this deck, walk you through to the hangar. Most of this deck's reserved for the crew who work and serve the guests on the ship. So here we've got the galley. You'll have to excuse the fire going on. We're in the middle of doing a VFX pass. So as we go through here, the crew, as well as having the seating area, they've got their own little recreation room. So they've got a pool table, the arcade machine and drinks fridge. And then outside of there, because on the other side of this door, we've got the hangar and it could be that we've got the hangar doors open and it's vented, so we've got a suit per member of crew so they can suit up before they go through. So you suit up and then of course we need an airlock so we don't vent the ship. We won't have it so both doors open at the same time that needs setting up yet. But we go through. It's a big ship with a big hangar and it's designed in such a way that the whole floor will rise up on these pillars that you see here and they'll take you up flush with the exterior, which if you know the shape, it's a big flat wedge and you'll be flush up there and it'll make landing and taking off a, a lot easier rather than trying to bring it in this place. Um, other things in here to note, we've taken a basketball cart and put that in there because you've got the excuse of a big open place. You'd use it for things, wouldn't you? I mean, it's a little nod to Prometheus there. And then the other things we've got in here, we've got grab plates so we can squeeze a bit more cargo up front end. So symmetrical on both sides, but essentially between all these pillars, we've got room for a bit more. And then at the far end, we've got access up to the man turret that is mounted on the top side. And then behind this door, we've got access to the man turret that's mounted on the belly of the ship. Okay, so if we move on on this deck, it forms a circuit, twin airlock just like on the other side. And then here is the waiting room, so you can imagine your rich guests. They'll come and sit in here while they're waiting for their 85X or whatever to come and pick them up. And then this is like a, a corridor that the guests would use for getting to their part of the ship. So I'll just quickly walk along here and then they'd go up in this lift, but then the only way between these crew decks with a cargo and the hangar 
is two elevators, one either side, the other one was in the kitchen, have you spotted it? And then in the event if power's down, we always need to make sure there's a way of getting around the ship. So we've got a ladder here. I'll just jump onto this. Just need to sync up the animation with the bars a little better, but with, that's just an easy edit. And you can take that to connect the, the guest pair to the ship from the lower ship. If I just quickly jump out of game mode, I can show you how the lighting might look in that scenario. So I just select this guy, hide it, put um, So obviously for ships, we do different lighting states. We've got auxiliary and we've got the emergency as well as the normal. The power's down, you might be under attack and the ship might be in a bad state. That might be one scenario where the lifts aren't working and you need to take the ladders to get around. Um, I've only just switched it on here for this one bit to show you. Okay, so that brings us up to the main guest section of the ship, through the atrium, and then behind this door, this is the, uh, the spare deck. So quickly drop into game, so we can just have a walk around here, show you what different elements we've got on this deck. So, as you go in to the right, got bench and lockers, Again, props have been doing some cool assets for us to put in the highlighting the bench here, obviously, so you can sit down on it. We've got two saunas and two showers. Over this side, we've got the jacuzzi. So you may have seen shots of this from a while back and it was a big rocky cave. Some people called it a grotto. It didn't really feel in keeping with the ship, so it's had a, a rework. And as it stands now, we've got this central jacuzzi. We've got a water wall at the back that we've lit. And it also acts as like a, a screen in, in one fashion where you can go behind and maybe get changed for going in. In here, you can probably see rocks and plant life. Then we've got a glass bottom and then we've got a fish tank. No fish at the moment, but if we get a fish tank, we'll get some fish swimming around in there. You can actually go in there, interact with the seats and sit down. Okay, so that's some of the rooms that we've been working on lately. Uh, there's 68 rooms in total that we'd like to leave for you guys to go and explore, but I hope you've enjoyed what I've shown you here today. The Nautilus brings exciting gameplay to the Star Citizen universe because it's something very traditional uh, for Chris Roberts style games. I think it just adds a, a, a lot of extra depth. Uh, our combat gameplay is very offensive based at the moment, so it's a, a lot of players going out there, hunting down other players, killing other players uh, and taking their stuff. Whereas there isn't a huge amount for the, the players that want to involve themselves in combat, but not actually be that sort of either twitch shooter or strategic bomber, they just want to play the longer game and this is, the, the Nautilus is the perfect ship for that. So one of the key aspects for mine layers and minesweepers is maintaining their minefields. Minefields offer a great way to uh, add defensive gameplay to Star Citizen. They allow players, whether they're in an org or solo players, to ring fence or protect a sort of strategic asset, whether that's a space station or even just entry methods to certain areas. We get the design brief from John Crew and his yeah. team, and that you know gives us our basic spec of what we need to hit. Chris likes to keep it as you know open as possible in terms of influences for art, so we can just be free basically. Out of the three, the one that Chris chose and the one that was our favourite, it's got that sort of armoured feeling about it, but then it also hits all the beats that we need it to hit. You know, it's got the big S7 gun on it. It's got, the, it's got the silhouette change when all the mine launchers pop out. As a ship, from all angles, it looks really good. The other stuff was, was interesting, but this one was a clear favourite. You know, when people see it, it's, it's a relatively simple shape. You know, it's essentially a triangle. Very Aegis, you know, it's kind of a, it's, you know, it's, it's like a tech sandwich. You know, you've got the top and the bottom, which are simpler and then you've got a slice of just heavy tech in the middle. 
Aside from the, the mine laying side of the gameplay, there's the people on the other end of mines. It ties into the whole scanning and exploration side, so these mines are quite hard to detect. Uh, so obviously you wouldn't want them to be huge gleaming red beacons of light that you know are there. They sort of embed themselves into the world quite nicely and ships that are designed for hunting things down, such as scanners, great, they can find them. If you want to go through a minefield, then the Nautilus itself can do some mine sweeping with its drones, but then other ships equipped with EMP or distortion weapons can temporarily disable them, which helps give uh, other combat ships uh, a way through these areas. And then there's the whole supply chain side. So whilst the Nautilus is best place to bring more mines and recover those mines, other ships will be able to sort of assist in that functionality as well. So this is the uh, Vanguard Sentinel. Right now the colour scheme on this is, uh, is temporary. We're kind of experimenting uh, just to see what we can do. The actual exterior of the Vanguard Sentinel is the same body as the Warden and the Hoplite. The actual weaponry and armaments are different. The main thing that changes with the uh, Vanguard Sentinel is the central uh, habitation pod. So this is where the uh, E-War gameplay is going to be taking place. So the actual terminal, it's like a, a larger version of what you have in uh, the Vanguard Warden. He has some screens for diagnostics. Right now they're using uh, temporary displays um, just for some uh, movement and life within this habitation pod. But I imagine in the future they could be replaced with uh, diagnostics and uh, relevant information for, for what you're doing. This entire area is uh, almost based around a, an aircraft carrier. One really cool feature about aircraft carriers is they have um, like big glass displays uh, which are illuminated you can, and you can draw on and you can see through these, so I wanted to try and get one of those in there. And also it's kind of based around um, things you might have seen from other sci-fi shows as well. Some features uh, in here are the same as the Warden. You've got like a bathroom and a uh, galley and some beds still. The, uh, the main feature is this uh, hacking station. So the difference between the Sentinel and the Harbinger, mainly visible on the interior. Here we have the new Harbinger torpedo room. One of the uh, biggest appeals of Vanguard Harbinger is being able to watch the torpedoes launch. I think uh, I've seen on, on, online some of the fans are quite eager to watch that. And the Sentinel and the uh, Harbinger should prove quite fun uh, variants of the uh, Vanguard. One thing that's um, still going to change about the Vanguard Harbinger is obviously where these torpedoes are going to get fired from, there'll be a uh, hatch underneath the ship so you can you know, see a torpedo go from inside the ship to uh, you know, firing away. The mechanism will be completely viewable. Hopefully you'll get as much fun from playing these things as I have from making them. So we look forward to uh, showing the, the finished off paint schemes in the future. The Star Citizen universe is one whose destiny is to expand throughout the cosmos, beyond its planets and moons, through nebula and jump points into the star systems that fill our galaxy. But with the upcoming Alpha 3.7, we're taking a look within, going deep below the surface to explore the cavernous depths of Stanton's planets and moons. From top to bottom, this week we're exploring the work bringing these new cave systems online, from the procedural tech that makes it possible, uh, first revealed on SCL earlier this year, to the way designers use those tools for making traversable layouts suitable to a variety of gameplay needs, then finally how lighting and audio designers set the mood and create an atmosphere that brings the whole thing to life. On the last um, Inside Star Citizen, we were showing the entire R&D phase that we have done. So since then, we have actually finished up all of our assets. Yeah, we've also involved all the other departments a bit more. We uh, are actually quite happy since all the building blocks are now in. We are now able to generate uh, a full cave. We had our caves being procedure generated by the layout tool, which is also used by the truck stops. And those truck stops, they float in space. They don't have the planet and the terrain as a context to them. So that's why it was tricky for us to embed these entrances as caves nicely on the terrain and, and have them generated so they, they don't you know, dip un, under the planet's surface and then uh, dip out again. That would be quite problematic. So. Yes. The content that gets created by the layout tool needed more information in order to work with those caves. And since the caves have to be put on planets, we used the placement tool that has been used for the outposts before. We um, actually managed to make it work and uh, now we are able to use the procedural layout tool together with the procedural placement tool on planets 
which is a quite nice heads up thing for the future whenever we want to create more content. The harvestables and mineables are scattered um, on tech points that are also procedurally scattered out in, in the caves. Um, so yeah, actually it's not, not just going to be um, empty caves that you walk in and out, but there's actually things to find, stuff to do, right? Uh, resources to gather. They are using our new organic shader, uh, which allows us to go for a much higher fidelity, you know, a much better definition in terms of shape. So it, it should be quite a, a level up in terms of quality for our geological assets. We planned to add a little bit more breakup to our rocky uh, archetype of caves. That means we have plant root-based elements that we overlay to break up the cold and, and harsh rocky angular surface. So um, in our, even though it's all procedural, uh, we have a decent amount of control, which, which means that uh, we can determine a cavern to be you know, completely covered in roots or have these glow worms sitting uh, at the roof and also the man-made content. Those are basically abandoned camps that uh, other NPCs left and you are now able to discover that kind of stuff. Yeah. So sometimes you might even find some dead NPCs in there, like people who tried to explore it but didn't survive. Procedural dead people. Oh yeah. <laughs> In the very first couple um, playtests, we realized that it is really difficult to tell where one should go, where you could climb onto and stuff like that. So we had to find a solution visually. And um, the solution for that actually was for us to add another element, which was like a little lichen layer on top of our rocks. And wherever that lichen is, we kind of try to navigate the player and lead the player towards um, the actual navigatable path. We spent a lot of time walking through our own caves and um, I've got lost myself as well, yeah. <laughs> many times. So maybe, maybe it will help with the orientation, you know, so, because then you, you get in and you don't get lost and maybe you can find your, yourself out. We're trying to push out for 3.7 and um, have the players uh, test what we have right now, the very first version of the caves that you know has the most necessary elements in it to, to make up such cave. But for the future, it means that we have this, this very big, nice to have list of ideas and elements yeah. definitely want to uh, tackle them in the future for sure, because it's way too exciting stuff. With the tech developed by Patrick and Florian and others on the planetary content team, the process of implementing caves then moves on to designers to create and ensure properly traversable layouts that can be used for interesting combat, future missions, and the upcoming FPS mining gameplay feature. For initial release, we are aiming for on-foot entrances. So we have uncharted and charted caves. There's also another secret variant that I won't mention. So the mood you're looking for in the cave is it's very close, very tight, very scary and dark, and very labyrinthine. For creating caves, we use the same technology that we use for creating rest stops. So what that is, is we create a rule set of rooms. So be that a connecting room that has two to three connectors on which we can connect corridors. And then the technology randomly generates whether that has a connecting corridor on it or just a cap. And then we can go from there and you can extrapolate that into a massive cave and we can create graphs within graphs within graphs and it can just explode into big, beautiful interior spaces. So the things we have to consider for traversal is making sure there's a good sprinkling of gameplay elements, small spaces, large spaces, really tight little places you have to squeeze around. So you would be crawling under things, commando crawling under things, mantling up over stuff. So there's a really sense of a different height so we really have to generate the graph and very carefully curate the order of the space and jump into game mode after we've generated it to make sure it feels right, really feels like you're splunking through a cave. So when we're generating caves, we have to consider the potential for FPS combat. So that would be making sure there's large open spaces that can hold more people, of course, because if you're fighting, there's more than one person. And then when it comes to FPS mining, we also have to think about where we want to spread the resources throughout the cave so that you have richer, potentially denser veins deeper in the cave, so you're rewarded for traversing through it. Uh, but for future releases, we'll be looking for massive sinkholes that you can land your ships in, and also huge cave entrances that you can drive your ground vehicles into. The players will notice there's areas of the caves that look lived in, and we aim to put AI there in the future so we can use those in missions and for other such exciting adventures.
We're really hoping people enjoy the caves because they bring a big opportunity for nice, small, tight spaces that we don't usually explore in Star Citizen. Once Gareth has validated a layout that works for all gameplay needs, it falls to our lighting artists to create an atmosphere that can both showcase the mysterious and unknown depths of, the, of any planet or moon and present this new endeavor in an effective manner that allows you to see where you're going without breaking the mood. Camera with the microphone. Okay. So just a clap. Uh, before we start with anything, with the lighting, we always to figure out what is the part that we need to focus on most. So for caves, the corners um, and the big rooms are the parts that we need to focus on because uh, it's very important to tell the player where you're at. We always give them a little bit of hint um, from the lighting. Like if there's a corner to the, to the left, then we just uh, put the lights to the, to the left of the, the corner. So uh, you can see, oh, there, there's a light coming through the left side. So it gives you a hint that, okay, maybe I can go that way. Maybe I can just turn left to figure out where to go next. And also it's pretty dark, so it's very tricky to balance because you want it to be very realistic, you want it to be dark, but you also need to help the player not to get lost in the, in the caves. So that's the biggest challenge. The atmosphere a little bit specular, especially on the cave rocks. There's some kind of parameters that which gives me a lot of control. Like for example, when the player get closer to uh, to the field light, the field light will disappear, and uh, surrounding you it's gonna be pretty dark. But the other uh, field lights are still on, so we use that kind of technology, like little tricks, to keep you dark surrounding you, give you like this tiny and um, scary kind of feeling. Glowing worms are nice, they're beautiful, they're like mystery. Uh, we work with the VFX team, they uh, apply those particles uh, on the rocks. When they finish their job, I just added those field lights to support this VFX. So yeah, when you go deeper down into the cave, maybe you encounter this kind of area with the glowing worms all over the ceiling above you, which is, uh, I think it's pretty nice uh, effect and a very special experiment for the players. The flashlight is pretty tricky because it's so strong at the moment, so it's kind of like flattening everything, so all the work from the environment might be washed away because of that strong light. So the lighting team is working very closely with the engineering team as well to improve the torch light, make it more subtle. And uh, even when you have the torch on, you, you are able to see uh, what the cave looks like and, and still give you that kind of uh, cinematic and moody uh, cave. So yeah, that's what we are trying to uh, fix. But Arthur's lighting only gets us halfway to where we're going as creating the proper soundscape is equally as important in adding character and flavor to these new subterranean environments. That's where James from the audio team comes in, as he takes the reins and brings the audible universe of Star Citizen to the cavernous reaches below. So the idea behind the caves was to create a, a more eerie mood. So by doing this, I designed a bunch of drone sounds and then a bunch of like one shots and things like that and they trigger randomly throughout the caves. Um, the deeper into the cave you go, the more of the one shots you get and the drones duck down in sound, just to give it a more eerie, kind of creepy vibe. So I've made the actual ATSs visible here so you can see how the sound has been placed around the map. One of the challenges we faced with this is the markup's different from other locations, so we couldn't use like room shapes to mark up. So these have got to have quite tight attenuation radiuses so the sounds don't bleed out throughout the map. So the idea behind the sounds for rooms like this is to have a lot of drones placed around the area and also fill the space out with one shots. One of the problems we had for areas like this is that it sounded too um, low passed and too bassy. So to bring out some high end, I've added some one shots, so like rocks falling and things like that, and water drips in the distance. And it just helps to 
make the space feel a bit more airy and add a bit of life to the area, while still sounding a little bit creepy. So this is what the caves look like from the outside. As you can see, they don't look like very much, but when we put these lights on, you can see that this is the basic room layout. So the floor actually gets like stuck on the bottom part here. And then I mark all the audio up in here. So you can see I've placed these speakers around the area, and these play like one shots, uh, debris falling, water drips, and drone sounds as well. So the idea is when you move around the room, the sound changes because you get closer to these speakers here. So as I go over here, you get less of these ones over here, which would be one shots and drones. So it just gives the air a bit of movement to it. So al although the room system looked a little bit confusing, once we're actually in the caves themselves, when all, they're all procedurally generated, it does make sense. Um, what I would normally do is I'd walk through these caves and listen to the transition between the rooms and then decide if I need to go back to the other room system and make any changes to it. One of the considerations for the caves was the actual reverb. So as you can see here, I've actually designed my own reverb sample for this. Uh, this is based on the room system which encompasses the entire cave itself. Further down the line I'd like to break this up into more granular pieces so we can set up reverb on small corridors and small parts of the cave just so there's a bit of variety to it. I hope this gives you a good idea of how the sound design in the caves is done. When we add the mission givers and NPCs to the caves it's going to create new challenges, things like how the voices are going to work in the caves with the new reverb system and other things that go along with that, like what props are going to be there. This is going to present new challenges for the sound design team that I look forward to sharing with you. We touch so many different elements of the game where we aren't sure what's going on. We would then go and talk to that person and we can share all the knowledge that we have. And likewise, if that person has a problem that you are more proficient in, they can come to you because we can cover so many different things, it's very important that we kind of share knowledge and that sort of thing. We touch all the different mechanics, all the different systems, all the different tools. And so in a lot of cases, people will specialize on their own systems. Thank you for watching. And just one more thing, if you want more relaxing stuff, um, I have a free newsletter that I sent out every Sunday. There I share relaxing and uplifting stuff that I enjoy and I think you could enjoy as well, like ideas, books and resources, but also ASMR and unintentional ASMR, so uh, you can find it at findcom.com slash Sunday.